When we think of innovation, we often think of new ideas, breakthroughs in science and technology and business. But sometimes I think innovation means we need to look at existing ideas and just rethink them for a new age. And the idea I want to talk about is our relationship with nature. And I think this is especially important because now we are an urban species. Over half of humanity lives in towns and cities, and none more so than us here in Singapore, living as we do in the most urbanized country in the world. Before I go on, I should say, given the uh, advice I give to students about plagiarism, is that uh, none of these ideas are particularly new or original. The innovation, perhaps, will come in how I frame them for you, but more importantly, what you then go and do with them. The concept I want to look at is environmental stewardship. Environmental stewardship is a concept that actually appears in the guiding statements of the institution that we, where we are today. The UWCSEA has a stated ambition to be world leaders in environmental stewardship. Yeah, not just good, but world famous. And I think if we are the people that uh, people are going to come to for advice, for guidance on this, well, we better know what we're talking about. And we think we know, yes? We think stewardship is about caring for the environment, protecting nature to hand it on for future generations, saving the earth. President Obama, at the recent climate uh, talks in Paris, said that this was humanity's last chance to save the planet. The language is familiar, isn't it? It's accepted. And if the language is not enough, then how about the visuals? Behind me, if you type in environmental stewardship to any image search, this image comes up more often than not. It shows, doesn't it, the, the caring human hands looking after gentle, fragile nature, that delicate seedling waiting to be planted. Here we are, saving the earth with our expert gardening. And with the offering hands, it seems to suggest, doesn't it, that we are a gift to nature. Here we are, generous humans, giving a gift to nature. But language and images are one thing. To actually know something, of course, you've got to do it. You've got to really feel it. And of course, for many of us in Singapore, that's a rare and rare chance to be able to do that. Not this morning. You're going to do it. And for this exercise, you're going to need two things. You're going to need a seed, and you're going to need a seedling. And if you look under your chair now, you should find a little red seed and a seedling. So can you look under the chair now? If you can't find one, and if you found two, pass one along to someone who's sitting next to you. What I want you to do is I want you to Ignore the seed for a moment, just put it somewhere safe in your pocket. I hope you all managed to have a seedling. Now, it looks like this. Because you're such a well-dressed audience, we've taken away most of the mud. But otherwise, this is the real thing. It's a real live seedling. It's a little bit desiccated now. But otherwise, I want you to Hold it in your hand, just like the image. I want you to feel yourself protecting nature, handing it on for future generations. Feels good, right? There's a problem, however, with this image. It suggests, doesn't it, that we are the caring humans, protecting nature, that we're giving something to nature. And I think this idea needs some innovation. In fact, I think it needs more than innovation. I think we need to break down this idea. I think we need to tear it apart, throw it down, and stamp it out. Well, go on. Do it. Break it down. Tear it apart. Stamp it out. You need to do it. Please. Stamp it right out. Rip it apart. Break it down. I'm guessing you might feel a little uncomfortable with that. <laughs> but let me reassure you, this plant 
It's just as natural as any other plant, but it's a weed. And this weed was found in our rainforest nursery, which we have on campus. And this weed, if we'd have been allowed to live, would have grown, seeded, and spread even more weeds, and choked to death the baby rainforest seedlings that we're trying to grow, the critically endangered rainforest seedlings that we're going to go. So, rather than feel uncomfortable, just congratulate yourselves for doing your bit to save the tropical rainforests this morning. Well done. And weeds aren't the only other thing that nature throws at us. Nature, in the past year, has given us droughts in Singapore. It's given us fungal diseases. It's given us bacterial diseases. It's sent down plagues of insects to eat our baby trees. Nature is a killer. And if nature thinks murder's all right, I think it's about time we taught it a lesson. So this seedling and all the other seedlings you've brutally murdered here this morning are going to end up on our campus compost heap. Well, they'll rot down to provide fantastic nutrients and compost, which will deliver to our campus vegetable gardens, which are used to grow some superb organic herbs, which have featured on the menu of Singapore's hottest new dining establishment that you've just heard about, Shen Li's Fresco Restaurant. You weren't expecting that, were you, Weed? To which nature would reply, well, actually, yes. That's what happens in nature. Things break down, and the carbon and the nitrogen in this just goes and finds somewhere else, in our case, more useful in our gardens. But those of you still uncomfortable with herbicide as uh, access to knowledge, maybe we need something else, a different way of knowing. And all innovation relies on imagination, seeing something that's not right in front of you. So I want you to engage your imagination now. I want you to imagine you're a satellite orbiting Earth. Close your eyes if you need to. You're one of those Google image type satellites. You've got a big camera attached to you. And as you hover over Earth, you're positioned over New York City. So in the frame of your lens is New York City, just the surrounding countryside. Imagine what your lens sees. You may just be able to pick out skyscrapers and freeways and parking lots and industrial estates. Endless suburbs. But if you zoom out a bit and you miss that detail, what is the color that you see looking down on New York City? There's one predominant color. What is that color? Picture it in your lens. Are you getting gray? Big mass of gray. Maybe a tiny little strip. Central Park is there in Manhattan of green. But otherwise, it's pretty much all gray. And I want you to imagine now that you have another lens on your camera, and a lens that allows you to go back in time, not just a few years, but 50,000 years. So can you just, in your imagination, switch your lenses now? You're still hovering over New York City, but this is long before humans have arrived. What do you see there now, in your imagination? Are you picturing Forests, maybe the old green pastures, rivers running through. Maybe if you zoom in a little bit, you're picking up a little bit of color of birds' plumage or lovely plants. But generally, you can probably imagine what color you're going to predominantly see. It's a mass of green, correct? Well, of course, it's completely incorrect. Absolutely wrong. Why? Because 50,000 years ago, all of North, practically all of North America, and certainly the bit over New York City, was in the grip of an ice age. An ice age that had lasted two million years and had wiped out all the forests and the pastures and the plants you've just imagined. And the only thing your camera lens really sees, apart from the odd white of a few receding glasses, is a mass of grey rock. Very few living things. And several million years before that, the oceans had just done exactly the same to the forests and the plants and everything there. And a few million, or probably a hundred million years, the, 
the ages get extended. Before that, the whole area was covered in volcanic ash and lava, wiping out all the species that have been there before. Because let's face it, of almost all the species that have ever existed since life has been here on Earth, practically everyone is now extinct. Okay, we've done our fair bit. We've made extinct a few species. We've changed the climate. We've dropped nuclear weapons. But throughout history, nature has already done that. And every time what's happened, nature has bounced back. It's adapted, it's changed, it's evolved. The idea that we can destroy nature or save the planet is utterly delusional. And quite frankly, it's a bit arrogant, isn't it? Really. If you want to see what happens when humans leave a city for just a few years, later on, go type in nature in Detroit into an image search, and you'll see how long it takes for nature to return. Nature will be here long after we've gone. So that means we have to abandon this, this language of saving the earth, saving the planet. Sorry, Obama, he, he meant well, and he actually did well, and I, I'm beginning to think we're going to miss him. But we have to realize that, in fact, we are part of nature. And our mission is not to save the planet, it's to work out how do we thrive, how do we survive as part of nature. So a mosquito lands on our arm, what do we do? We kill it. Every day, we're killing thousands of bacteria every time we wash our hands. But we need those rainforests as well, so we save the rainforests. And we need to do more than just survive, we need to thrive. So what do we do? We spend millions of dollars protecting tigers, which is a good thing. Because it's good for our soul, isn't it, to know that we've protected something so fierce and dangerous that wouldn't think twice about killing us, but we've managed to do that and protect it. So that's a good thing. How do we work out then what to do? How do we work out how, what's our place in nature? Well, luckily, nature has allowed us to do that. Because nature has evolved the most complex living organism on the planet which I'd love to say is a tree, but these are just the largest living organisms on the planet, the most complex is, of course, the human brain. And the human brain, nature's wonderful brain, has allowed us to evolve so we can innovate to work out our place in nature. To innovate so we can adapt, we can evolve, so nature is not just our little child, or our enemy, but in fact, nature is the way we live, adapting and evolving. I want to give you an example. This here is Caliphylum inophylum, which I know is a bit of a tricky Latin name, but the, it's better than the English name, which is probably the most graceless name ever given to a tree. It's called the ball nut tree. I know, right? But it's that ball-shaped nut that when pressed, gives an oil so rich it was used in Pacific Islands for lighting oil when there was no other fuel available. Later on in the Pacific War in 1940s, they used the fuel to generate, to put in generators to power radios during the war. And more recently, it's just been certified as a biodiesel for vehicles in the USA. The oil has been used for varnish, it's been used for waterproofing, it's been used for a dye, it's been used to treat eczema, it's been used for rheumatism. In fact, it's got so many medicinal properties that biotech scientists have now isolated a compound in the nut called a coumarin that has potential as an antiretroviral treatment for HIV sufferers. We've got about six, seven, eight specimens of these on campus, and we mainly planted them because well, it was indigenous, and we, we like the leaves. But through nature's innovation of our brain and our acute observation of nature, we just may have found a cure for our energy problems and a cure for one of our deadliest diseases. And that solution is growing right around us now. I want to give you another example. And for this, you'll need your seed. So could you take out your seed now? And I want you to hold your seed 
in your hand like this. This is Adenantha pavanina. You might know it as a saga seed. It's quite famous here in Singapore. Like the Caliphylum, it has a myriad of properties that we haven't got time to talk to you about today, but you can go and look them up. And even with the Caliphylum, the nut was just the only thing. I didn't even tell you about the bark or the leaves or the flowers and what they could do. So let's just look at our seed, our saga seed. And I'll only tell you one property. So just hold it in front of you, look at it, admire its bright shininess, but more importantly, feel its weight in your hand. Because the property of this seed, any four of these seeds in your row, in this room, anywhere around in Southeast Asia, weigh almost exactly one gram. So reliable was that measure that gold sellers used to use them as weights in the old gold markets because their clients would know they were trustworthy if they saw the saga seeds. They were getting a good deal. So the seed itself sort of came to represent value. And here in Chinese culture, of course, being bright red really helped that notion, isn't it? Red is fortune, it's love, it's wealth. Talking of wealth, let's go back to that image there. As well as in environmental organizations and schools, there's another common place that you will see this image in advertisements for banks and investment companies. You may have seen it, HSBC and things like that. They love to use it because it represents, doesn't it, the bank looking after your little investment, safeguarding it for the future, growing it into something much bigger. It's a fantastic metaphor. But of course it's not a metaphor because effectively all the wealth on this planet comes from nature. Every single thing, even the intelligence that came out of nature's brain that's making us realize that every innovation, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a scientist, whether you're an engineer, has to be based on environmental stewardship, looking after the wealth that nature's given to us. Nature is our gift, and this seed is your gift. So what are you going to do with your gift? Are you going to plant it and grow a seedling of a saga tree like we did here in Singapore? Are you going to turn it into jewelry, collect a few more? Some have made them into most beautiful jewelry. Or are you going to leave it on your desk, on your shelf at home, as a reminder that your quest is the same as the quest of the rest of humanity, to work out how you thrive as being good stewards of nature, the nature that has given us, us everything we need to flourish on this earth. So hold your seed tight. Thank you very much.